Louise, it's your your time. Oh. Hi. So do we have yes, we have people. Hello everyone. Welcome from welcome to the CMS control room. Uh, so we are here in the uh, French countryside. Um, I don't know if we'd, well, we'll get the other one introduce himself in a second. So my name is Louise. Um, I'm a physicist on uh, CMS experiments and I work for Northeastern University in, in Boston. And uh, today we are going to take you on a tour um, both of the control room uh, for CMS, which is where uh, we operate our detector, but also you're going to get a chance to, to really go underground and see the detector itself in, in all its glory. Uh, so, yeah. Amanda, do you want to say any anything or did you already speak with the participants? No, I haven't had a chance to. Hi, everyone. Um, you've seen me a few times uh, throughout your uh, uh, Target Summer Institute, so thanks for being here. Um, if you have questions, this is a webinar setting, so we can't like see your faces, but um, use the Q&A button at the bottom to, to ask questions as you have them throughout the tour. And thank you all for being here. This is I've seen this like five or six times and it just keeps getting cooler. So I'm really excited we're able to do this. And thank you to everyone over at CMS for being available to do this for us. Yeah. Great. So I have the other guide here. So introduce this is Andres, um, who's in the back here. Um, he will be the second guide for today's visit. So I'm going to stay here in the control room while Andres will be the mobile guide. So he will take you around on both first the surface and then going underground as well. Cool. Yeah, thanks. I, I'm, I think I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Yeah, why don't we start? Mm -hmm. And again, if you have questions, uh, you can put them in the chat, as, as Amanda said, and, and we'll try to, uh, sorry, in the, in the q and I'm sorry, in the <laughs> Q&A, uh, and then we'll try and answer as, as we go along. Okay. Would you like to have this? Yeah, why don't we, oh, the mobile guide has actually started now, so why okay. don't we switch then, to on this? Just switch to okay, Andres, go ahead. Okay, well, I, I didn't really want to say anything specific, but I kind of, uh, I'm showing right now, sort of the view from the air and you can see some of the buildings, some of the facilities of where we are right now. But um, I'm not sure how familiar the audience is with uh, where we are. So maybe Luis, you can say a few words. Okay. Yes. Let's see if we can get up the picture here. Right, so what you see here is a aerial view of the local area here where CERN is located. Um, you have the yellow ring, which is where the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider is located. If you actually were sitting um, in a plane looking uh, from above, you wouldn't actually see this yellow ring because it is underground, about 300 feet or so underground. Um, but this is where it's located. It's on the border of Switzerland and France. Um, you see the Alps in the background. The big white peak is Mont Blanc, the tallest mountain in, in the Alps. Um, and we are right now at the CMS detector site, which is located over in the left hand side of the picture. So this is really out in the French countryside among the fields. Um, and the detector itself, as you'll see, is, is, is also underground, about 300 feet or so. Uh, then on the other side of this big ring, which is 27 kilometers in circumference, or about 17 miles, um, we have the so-called main CERN site. So this is where a lot of office buildings are located. We have various labs and and uh, it's also near where the so-called atlas detector which is another large particle detector here at cern is located we also have the um two 
more targeted experiments, so-called LHCB and ALIS, all located underground in large uh, cavities. And then in the background, you also see Geneva, which is the largest, largest city in the local area. And for scale, you also see the where it says LHCB, where Sultan is putting the pointer right now, is the Geneva airport. That's the runway for, for scale here. So that is where we are right now. Um, and I am not familiar with exactly what kind of background you all have. So I'm just going to give you a few minutes spiel about why we're here and what we're doing. And if you've heard it before, well, you get a repeat. And if not, um, you can get an introduction. So what we're really doing here is that we have the so-called Large Hadron Collider, which is a particle accelerator. It accelerates tiny, tiny particles, elementary particles, protons specifically, um, to almost, almost the speed of light. And why would we do this? Well, the reason that we do it is that when these particles then collide, um, they have very, very high energy in these collisions. And through that energy, new particles can be created that we can study using these large detectors like the CMS detector. So the CMS detector is, is in many ways like a giant digital camera that sits and records what happens in these collisions to try and analyze what's going on. And why would we care about these tiny particles in the first place? Well, the backstory there is that it is really what we would call fundamental physics. We're trying to understand how nature works, how the universe works on a very, very small scale. Because as one example, if you look up at the sky at night, you see the stars, you see the planets, but there's a lot out there that we don't know what it is. In fact, a large fraction of all the mass in the universe, we often call dark matter, we don't even know what it is. It's probably made up of some particle, some new tiny particle, but we don't know what it is. And there are other questions like that that is really the fundamental motivating what we're doing here at CERN. So with that, um, I see Andres is going around a little bit. Um, should we show quickly the picture of the CMS detector that I oh, see yeah. that you had there also? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me just go back since then I have moved a bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, so just to orient you also before we um, start the, the more details of the tour. So this is a sketch of the CMS detector. It is built up kind of sort of like an onion structure. It has many different layers of different types of particle detectors. And these different detectors are each specialized to record and deduce information about different types of particles. We have some detector which is specialized in tracing electrically charged particles. That's the tracker, the silicon tracker, because it's made of silicon modules, similar to what you find in um, chips in uh, computers or phones. Um, we also have calorimeters that are dedicated for measuring energies of particles, like electrons, for example. Um, and we have um, the outer part is called the muon system. It is dedicated to detecting and measuring uh, properties of muons, which is a heavier version of an electron, basically. And so you see for scale here, a person that, um, standing um, in black on the so-called visitor, um, well, it's on the platform, but you see for scale how, how large the person is in comparison to the detector. So the detector itself is, has a diameter of about 15 um, meter and is about 29 meter, 30 meters long. Um, and the weight of the CMS detector, you'll see it's very compact. It's very, very heavy. Um, and it weighs uh, 14,000 tons, which is the same roughly as twice the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Um, and you will see much more about the CMS detectors. So why don't we allow? Yes, so, Andres, go Andres ahead. To talk about yeah. the control room. Yeah, so I was very quickly gonna, since you were showing the detector, there are some old photos here 
of when it was being put together. And that, that's one thing about our detector. It's very photogenic and you can find many, many photos. If you, I think especially on CDS, you can find the best ones. But if you Google around, there's lots of cool ones. Uh, so there are, CMS control room is split into two. I first started to show you guys this side of the room. And this is where we have the detector experts. And we have several uh, sort of islands where the experts are working on calibrations or they're running tests of any of some sort. Um, and you can also see that we have celebrated some uh, milestones with a few bottles of champagne. Some of them have some uh, event displays even. But going back to the main control room, maybe I can let you describe it, Luis, so that we're not both unmuted. Sure. So in the main control room, uh, we have the so-called central shifter stations. So whenever the CMS detector is turned on in any way or form, we have to have people there monitoring both the safety of the detector, but also there are a lot of people working here at the experimental sites. There are workers underground, um, and it's really important to have people here 24 seven to monitor also the safety of those working underground. And so here we are seeing the so-called shift leader station. So that's the person who is uh, responsible during an eight hour block for the overall uh, operation and safety of the experiment. Um, and we also have some other substations that are not um, being used right now. We have someone who is responsible for... Um... <laughs> oh, hi again. <laughs> um, the uh, data taking, uh, someone who is responsible for making sure that the data that we actually record is of good quality. So there are dedicated shifters for them. And so typically you will have when we're really accumulating new data, when the LHC is operating, which is it, it's not right now, we'll have five people here in the central part of the control room. And I think Anders is showing you one of the many screens that the um, one of the shifter will, will yeah, look so like. Yeah, so this is the main DAQ desk. And when, the, uh, when it's really running, there's a cool green button that says start. And that's the, you know, that's how we start recording data. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, over in the central part of the detector here, you can also see a big, um, what do we call it? Um, synoptic. Synoptic <laughs> uh, showing um, the status of different detector, uh, different parts of the detectors. It also has um, switches that in case of an emergency, one can do a, really a, a hard switch off of either different parts of the detector or the whole detector. And over here in the other corner is where we have the so-called technical shifter. Um, and we have a lot of screens that you can see that show um, it both has cameras showing different areas underground and on surface. Um, here we see uh, cameras showing um, the different entry exit points um, to the uh, to the underground facilities. And um, we have the elevator uh, camera as well. And some of what is done here is is really related again to the safety of the detector, monitoring um, any type of alarm that might come up with um, related to temperatures or there's a lot of um, gas, different types of gases that are used um, for cooling, for example. Um, and so monitoring the gas flows and voltages and all things like that is being done there. All right. Yes. And I think Anders will continue now to I go I guess ahead. we got a question on the chat. OK. So there's a question, when was the manual actions control panel built? Can those actions be done digitally as well as manually? So I don't know when it was built. We've certainly had something like it for a long time, but I think it was replaced some years ago. There was an earlier yeah, yeah. version. After, after LS1 has been replaced, but actually these manual actions are, are, are uh, especially those safety things like the water mist where uh, obviously, we need a manual okay for 
starting the water mist if we are in the control room. So this is what we have to think of these manual actions with. Uh, obviously, there is there is a there is a electronics behind, but the last word should be given by a human. Yeah. Uh, of course, if we leave, if we leave the control room alone, this might happen when we don't take data, especially these days. We turn this on, so then the the automatic uh, safety system works alone. So let's go over to oh, our yeah. mobile guide who is just going in now. Oh, yeah. So, Andres, do you want to take over? Okie doke. So here you see Noemi going into one of the entry booths. And here you can see that it uh, checks your, okay, you first need one of these dosimeters and it has an RFID and that uh, is checking that you have the dosimeter, that you have the proper permissions, uh, the right trainings and so on. And it also checks. Hello, yeah. I think, I think we, we lost we, them we for, lost a them second. For, a, for a second. So, so actually I think we can continue what Andres told. So that's a biometric identification uh, panel there. Uh, we have a nice iris scanner. If you remember the angels and demons, there was exactly the same type of uh, access uh, booth there with a slightly different uh, iris scanner. Actually, that was a real iris scanner that we used that model for long, but this is a newer version. It checks for both irises and also that there is a blood circulation in it. If you remember the, the film, you know what I mean. <laughs> All right, I think yeah, yeah. I'm just lost you for a second, but I think we have you again now. Oh, no. Yeah, sorry, we, we disconnected for a minute. So yeah, we're still in the elevator area and we're just- uh, I don't get a picture from you. A, a picture from? Oh, uh, you, we from don't have- From you, yeah. We, they don't see the picture. Ah, okay. Okay. Maybe I can say a few words while the mobile guides are, oh, well, there it's back. Um, yeah. We have a little bit of time here now for, for all of you listening where um, the guide is going into the elevator and going underground. There's some spotty network where we might lose them occasionally. So. Oh, sorry. Okay, so yeah. we're going into the elevator, which was uh, recently, I guess a year or two ago, it was installed. And at least the new one. <laughs> yes. So you can see that the elevator is pretty simple. There's not too many floors. Um, but once we go minus two, right? So we go to minus two. And even if you go to minus one, you're going to go underground for quite a bit. You can maybe see. And Luis, feel free to take over because I think we're going to. Yeah. I will <laughs> exactly. I will take this opportunity while they're going underground about 100 meters down um, to answer one of the questions in the Q&A. So the question is, what happens um, with the energy created by the particle collisions in the accelerator? Can it be used sustainably? So this is a great question. Um, the, in short, the energy that is cr created, we don't actually create energy because energy cannot be created out of nothing. Energy can be transformed between different uh, forms, if you wish. So what happens in these collisions is that um, particles are accelerated, they're moving very, very fast. And so similarly, if you think of like two cars um, going in opposite direction at five miles an hour versus at a hundred miles an hour, there's a lot of energy in that collision that can be um, turned into, well, either not very much happens or completely destroy and scatter parts of the cars everywhere. In these collisions, um, at the, because it's a very, very small scale, it's not actually a lot of energy from a macroscopic perspective, but because it's in such, such a small space, it's very comparatively large energy. But that energy, 
can be converted to mass of new particles that are created in the collisions. And this is really Einstein's famous E equals MC squared. Energy and mass are equivalent. So we are not creating energy out of, of, out of nowhere. We're really converting energy between different uh, forms. But uh, I just want to draw the attention that we are working on a completely different energy scale as the normal life we have. And even on this energy scale, we cannot create energy. Yes. So the energy conservation law is so, so strict that we cannot. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, the, there's another question. What is the main language used to communicate at the lab? Um, I would say that it's a mix of English and French. It is primarily for the most part English, but it depends a little bit on what exactly you're working on and what you're doing. So typically among the physicists, um, the main language is English. Among the more um, targeted, for example, technicians and engineers, there can be a lot of French. There can also be a lot of other languages, German, Russian, etc. Hungarian. Hungarian, <laughs> <laughs> Swedish. No, I don't have many people to speak Swedish with. Um, but, but it tends to be more the local language, French especially, um, and, and it depends, again, more on um, if you have large groups of, of local workers, for example, they tend to be French speaking, and so there the language is more French. Um, but primarily, if I had to pick one, I would still say English. Um, and I see that Andres is showing us some very cool stuff now underground. So Andres, do you want to say a little bit about what you are showing us? Sure. Um, so. I am now in what we call the service cavern. We also sometimes call the counting room. And we have two of these rooms. Uh, I don't know if you were able to see earlier that there are multiple, multiple racks in this room. We have another one just like it upstairs. So in this room, you can see some of the sign. I mean, you can see some are labeled. Some you can get an estimated guess of what they are. These, I think, are all high voltage power supplies. But there are some hints here and there. These orange striped lines means, mean that these systems stay on even in the event of a power cut. So these are usually uh, related to safety and it's not just human safety, but also the safety of the detector. So some of these systems might control, uh, you know, some parts of the detector that if they stop running, this could be, you know, related to the tracker. So if there's a power cut, some systems still need to be operational for the safety of the tracker itself, the detector itself. Uh, and just like we have those systems, there's a lot of other stuff here. So I wanted to show what I was just showing you before. Uh, these are just a bunch of fiber optics. And these, by reading the labels, I can tell you they're tracker end cap, but uh, some of these racks that we have here are related to the what we call the trigger, which uh, I, I, I know, I think these are either DAQ or trigger, and they blink, they're pretty cool. But uh, it's, I don't, I don't, I didn't hear you talk about the trigger, maybe now is a good time to describe it if you want to do that, uh, Luis. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about the trigger. It's in fact something that I work a lot on myself, so I find it um, extra fun. Um, so in short, when the Large Hadron Collider is operating and accelerating particles or protons and then have these particles collide in the center of the detector, we have particles colliding 40 million times per second. So every 25 nanoseconds, so 40 million times per second. That creates an enormous amount of energy. If we could read out and record all of the information, it corresponds to something like 40 terabytes per second. Um, for scale, your typical laptop might have half a terabyte, if that, as a storage unit. And so we produce 40 terabytes per second. And then running that seconds, minutes, hours, days, it would just be enormous. There's no way that we could read it out and record it. It would be prohibitively expensive. So instead, what we do is that we try and identify 
among these coalitions, which ones are they actually potentially interested in? What, what are the coalitions that are interesting that we want to record? Because in fact, many of them are not creating uh, particles like a Higgs boson, for example, that we might be curious to study, but are more like what we would call lower energy scattering that contain processes that have already been studied for decades. And so from the LHC perspective, we care less about them. And so this is the trigger system. And it's done in two different steps. There's first a step, which is a hardware-based trigger. What that means is that it is processes that are implemented not in a like computer program, um, but in a dedicated um, processing unit in hardware, like what we're looking at here. And that's because it has to be super fast. Um, and that has of the order of a microsecond to do an initial filtering of this potentially is a interesting particle collision that we want to process further, or this doesn't look interesting, we can throw it away. Um, and that reduces the number of collisions that we are processing from 40 million per second to about 100,000. And then those get sent to a second part of this trigger system, which has a little longer time and is implemented more like a traditional software program. And um, that reduces to about a thousand per second, which is what we actually then read out from the detector and save to disks. And so this system is really important because it's, it, it's literally that either these collisions are saved or they're thrown away. And once they're thrown away, they're gone for good. So um, it's, it's really the first part of the processing chain and it's a very critical part of it. So Luis, can I uh, Go just ahead. very quickly interrupt for a second and I just wanted to introduce my colleagues here. So this is Joanna and this is Anne. And right now, so right now they're hard, hard at work. Uh, oh, they just had a signal, but I wanted to show you the signal, but it's gone. Uh, and <laughs> Joanna, can I, can I do a 20 second interview with you? What are you guys up to? Oh, here's the signal again. So Joanna, you have to speak pretty loudly because you don't have a microphone, but what, what is going on? No, I'm afraid we don't hear. Yeah, so, we okay, hear. I'm just gonna, yeah, I'm gonna repeat what she's saying then. So you are doing what again, sorry? Yeah, checking the back end. They're checking the back end, which means all of this readout system that you, you see here. It is very complicated. You can see there's many, many cables and a lot of NIM logic. So that means there's a lot of modules in here. And uh, any, I mean, these are not physicists, so you gotta, uh, so anything in particular that you're doing today that you want to accomplish? You can see the signals here. So we, let me just, I don't mean to interrupt you and, and everything, but we just installed a detector like on Monday. And yet now we're making sure that all of the signals are the way we expect and so on. So there's a lot of adjustments, a lot of work that has to go on with these systems. And with that, I'm gonna, uh, get out of their way. Sorry to interrupt. And uh, yeah, good luck. Okay, Luis, do you want to, I'm just going to start making my way to the cavern. So I think you can take over in the meantime. Yeah, so okay, so what we see now is that Anders is moving from um, what is called the service cavern. Um, we have a couple of different large cavities or rooms underground. One is the one uh, where the detector is located, the experimental cavern. And then we have the so-called service cavern where we have um, the trigger systems. We have the, um, yeah, here we see a, a picture. So the, uh, where it says USC55, um, this is the uh, service cavern. Um, where we were just uh, seeing these different electronic racks, um, etc. Um, and then we're going to go over to the experimental cavern where the detector is, is located. Um, so if I could just say a quick word. Um, yeah. So if you, I don't know if you can see the video right now, but uh, I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of trainings and most of these are safety trainings that we have to do. 
uh, and we have a lot of alarms. Here's, for example, a, an alarm that, you know, when you don't when you don't drink your coffee, this alarm uh, makes a loud noise to wake you up. Um, of course, that's not it. It's uh, it's a oxygen deficiency hazard alarm. So we have to learn how to you how to get or where to find these what we call self rescue masks. And you can see our model here uh, wearing one of these. And the trainings can be pretty interesting. Like uh, for this training, you have to learn how to uh, put on this mask, uh, disassemble it and wear it correctly in under 40 seconds and under a lot of noise and a lot of stress. So it's, it's pretty cool. Back to you. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and someone asked about this, that there's a lot of uh, restrictions uh, going underground as we talked about with a retina scanner. And, and this is, very much driven by safety reasons. We don't want anyone who doesn't have the appropriate training or equipment or doesn't know what they're doing to accidentally be able to access um, a, a, an area that might be dangerous. Um, and I also, I see this uh, on this show, an, a nice picture here, which is um, a picture of what it looks like inside of the LHC tunnel. So the the blue part there is the LH, the actual LHC, the accelerator um, is part of the uh, magnets. We have very, very large magnets as part of the LHC, which are used to bend the trajectories of the particles as they move around the, the LHC. And these uh, magnets, different type of magnets are also used to keep the particle beams focused, kind of like how you would use you can use optics like glass lenses to bend light. We use strong magnets to bend the path or to focus, sorry, the, um, the, the beams. So uh, I can also add a few words. I mean, the LHC is really fascinating, uh, but one of the things that when I always, when I walk by this corridor, I always, ha you know, I find this picture amazing. So all of the protons that we use just come from a regular hydrogen bottle. And when you think about it, I mean, it's not even a big bottle. And by the way, this picture is a bit out of date. Um, there's a different facility that provides the first stages of acceleration. You can see it's Linac 2 in the background. Now we're using Linac 4. But when you think about it, there's a lot of protons in here. You know, it's just regular hydrogen. If you get rid of the electrons, you have protons and there's a lot of them. So. Uh, one of these bottles is enough to last, I think, the lifetime of the LHC. So. And as Luis was saying, the LHC has a lot of elements, but one of the things that's also very interesting is that there is sort of a chain, right? So I, I mentioned the first stages of acceleration, but, uh, and that's just, uh, this should say now Linac 4, you send the protons to a booster and then they go to the PS and then they go to the SPS and finally they go to the LHC. But something else that's really, really interesting is that these facilities are really old. You can see the PS is from 1959 and it used to be the, you know, the best and the state of the art back then. You know, the SPS is from 76 and there's a Nobel Prize that was won from the super proton synchrotron uh, research that was done at the time, some particles were discovered, and now you have the LHC. So it's also very historic in that sense. There's a lot of accelerators that predate others, and they just sort of uh, now are in service of the LHC. I think if I if I may have a, a, a comment or or, or um, a remark on this. So one might ask the question, why do we do this hocus pocus? Why don't we accelerate the proton straight from the bottle? And the answer is uh, that this is very similar to the gearbox on your car. I know that in the US, the, the gearbox <laughs> is automatic, but here in Europe, we I think most of the cars are, are, are just a, a manual gearbox ones. So, uh, we could drive a car in gear number three. We could we could uh, start the car and we could drive on the, the motorway as well. But in both extremities, we, we would face technical problems. Actually, starting a car in, in gear number three is not so easy. And I do not recommend anyone to, to drive in gear number three on the motorway. Uh, 
so that's a technically the thing uh, uh, due to the due to the optimal torque delivery of the of the the engine and this is this is very similar what we have here we could build an accelerator to accelerate proton straight from the the bottle but this would be a, a suboptimal absolutely we would lose a lots of particles during the during the acceleration but technically this is this is useful and 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 much better if we use small accelerator at the beginning and then a bigger one and and, and an even bigger one uh, and historically here at CERN we had this we had the old accelerators we could just simply reuse them and this this made a a, a close to optimal uh, acceleration so that's why we do this hocus pocus and and of course this uh, this is also not an easy job because uh, uh, injecting a beam from one accelerator to the other is really a challenge, but this this is still a good price for the the optimal operation. Yeah, that's a that's a great okay. analogy. I like that. All right, so I I wanted to just take a second to actually welcome you guys to the CMS detector. We are finally here, and here it is. And it is pretty cool. Uh, Luis, I can hand it over to you and I'm just gonna walk around. Whenever you see something in particular that you want me to uh, show more of, please let me know. Yeah, thanks. All right, so indeed here you have the CMS detector itself. Um, right now, the detector is actually pulled apart. Um, so you see, in the middle, there is a silver um, uh, pipe that is the, and this is pointing this out now, that is the so-called beam pipe. Um, so that is where the proton particles um, will travel uh, through. So unlike the picture that we had before from the tunnel where the LHC um, the the beams were contained inside of these large magnet blue stuff that we were looking at um, when the particle beams actually move through into the center of the detector where they collide they have the two beams in opposite directions they go through a very thin um uh, pipe because we want the pipe to then um to not be stopping any particles that are created essentially um, but so right now the detector is pulled apart. That's why you can see it like this. Um, and uh, you see the, uh, you saw the red and the silver part. That is the so-called muon system, which is specifically designed to um, detect and record muons, a heavy version of an electron. Um, and uh, now they are walking up uh, where we will be able to get a different view of the detector. And one thing that I will also note, when you're doing this as a virtual visit, you really get a chance to see, in many ways, much more than what you can do if you go uh, on a regular underground visit, which we are not doing right now either way, um, because you really can see from different directions the detector. And so here we're looking from, from above, you see the yellow and blue stuff. Um, that is temporarily there because, as I said earlier, the LHC is not running right now. We are in a shutdown period where there are maintenance going on on the detectors and on the accelerator. Um, and so that yellow and, um, and blue is platforms to allow people to, to work on the detector parts. Um, so we're going a bit uh, uh, even higher to so the highest point that we can to show you the detector from above. All right, yeah, so here we see the detector from even further up. You see a lot of cables coming out, uh, recording and um, reading out uh, information from the different sub detectors. Um, and so that um, the part on the right will otherwise be um, pushed into the part on the on the left here, um, and yeah, so you can see it's it's very large. It's several stories high, um, and uh, it is as we said also before. It's it's really a compact um, detector. There's not much air between the different um, the different parts of the detector. Um, 
and uh, yeah, what else can we see so, here? So Luis, I, I wanted to point out something that's very, very unique that you can see right now. Uh, so as we mentioned, or I don't, I don't remember if you mentioned that we just replaced the beam pipe. And uh, that's again, this tube that goes through the center where the particles travel through and they collide. Um, not only did we replace the beam pipe, but of course, in order to do that, we had to replace all the innermost parts of the detector. So now the pixel detector is back in place. And now uh, as we speak, we are in the process of sealing what we call the bulkhead, which is where the tracker and the pixel are enclosed in. And you can maybe see on this table, there are three pieces of sort of copper colored panels. So those panels are the ones that actually seal the bulkhead. Uh, so that's, a, that's pretty unique. That's something that's happening today. You would otherwise never see that. So um, maybe just to add a little bit more, Luis has mentioned the muon system. Um, there's many muon systems, as a matter of fact. So what you can see here, for the most part right now, I think are mostly CSCs. I don't think we see RPCs, right? But in any no, case. No, I don't think so. No. Oh, this is the T? Well, actually, the RPCs are, are, are on the top and below of the, the DT chambers, ah, okay. but they are very thin. So probably you won't see from, okay. from here, maybe on from the surface, from, from X1, you could. Yeah. Well, uh, but in any case, I mean, there's, there's now there are four of these systems that we mentioned a lot of acronyms. There are DTs, which are the easiest to remember. Those are drift tubes. We mentioned CSCs, which, which are cathode strip chambers. We have RPCs, which are resistive plate chambers, and those are pretty fast, and we can use them to trigger to, to trigger on events, as Luis was describing. And now uh, we have the GEMS, and the GEMS, is, these are gas electron multipliers, but they are only located, for, for now at least, they're only located on, let me see where my finger is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I have to look at the camera. So they are, so we, we call this entire piece that's sticking out, we call it the nose. And let's say at the base of the nose, this is where the, uh, the gem modules are inserted into. Um, so as Luis said, right now the detector is open. You, would, would, you can imagine that it just, when we seal it, we have to move these wheels, so we call them slices. Uh, we have 15 of the slices. And one of the cool things that I am not really very easily able to tell, but I'll show you guys later, is that we have wheels down towards the bottom. And in order to move the slices, we can just blow compressed air down. If you look really carefully, you might see this orange thing over there. I think that's one of them. Maybe not, I'm not sure. Uh, but that's the way we do it. We, we blow compressed air and then we use this machinery to move the slices into and out of place. And you can sort of see, uh, if you see these large blue racks, those are three separate slices. So you can kind of see how wide, it, or maybe you can just show them here. So you see the stairs over here and between the stair, well, I guess a little bit further, I guess from over here, you can see that gap, maybe this gap, actually, this is cool. You see this gap here, that gap goes all the way through, uh, except for the magnet. I think the solenoid is in the in the way, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. otherwise, yeah, you can see <laughs> in principle, you can see all the way down. So, um, I think, so this is, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I don't think that we actually mentioned this whole thing about the magnet inside of the CMS detector. And so CMS stands for compact muon solenoid. I've mentioned several times that it's very compact, the detector, and I've mentioned the muon part because a large part, if you look at the detector, is actually the muon system, this um, red and silver part. But then the next part, which maybe Ander can point out, yeah, exactly the silver part that is inside is a solenoid magnet. Um, and why would you put a giant magnet in the middle of a particle detector that is trying to record particles? The reason is that um, some of you may, may know, again, I'm not super familiar with your backgrounds, 
that what happens to a charged particle, an electrically charged particle in a magnetic field? Well, it will feel a force and its trajectory will be bent. And we use this information to deduce the momentum of electrically charged particles. Um, and it's a very, very critical uh, component in how we can uh, work out what happened in the collisions. We need to know the momentum of the different particles. And so that's why we have this large magnet or solenoid inside. So it, engineering wise, it's very, very interesting. It's, uh, I believe the largest superconducting single piece magnet, or let's say the largest superconducting magnet of its kind, it's got a six meter inner diameter. And as I said, it's superconducting. So all this infrastructure that you see uh, that I'm showing you now is for the magnet. Um, so we need to circulate helium, liquid helium at 4.2 Kelvin in order to retain the superconductivity in the magnet. And once we have those conditions, we can circulate 18,000 amperes of current through the magnet, through the solenoid, in order to generate 3.8 Tesla uh, of magnetic field. Yeah, that is very cool. <laughs> Agreed. In the meantime, we got a, a new question concerning a very interesting thing. Uh, Alex noticed tons of wires and cables. His question is whether they have, uh, whether, whether there is anything to prevent the electromagnetic interference uh, on the sensor data. That's a very good question. This is one of the one of the biggest problems that might happen. Uh, so uh, we try to change the the sensor data medium, transfer medium to optical. Um, most of the detectors are now communicating the data on an optical way in a digital format. So this is something that that prevents the uh, the, the the interference and also we use extra clean power uh, which is free from any ripples and also we we make a a, a huge effort to uh, uh, to prevent to make ground loops for example that that is uh, usually the, the biggest source of the, the interference so we have a we have a group that deals with only these problems so, but the question was very interesting and very good and thanks for that because this is one of the biggest problems of of such a detector yeah all right so we're gonna make our way to the surface and uh just i i think we mentioned it at some point but the surface is really 100 meters underground um and i i don't recall if this was mentioned as well but you know, one of the reasons we have to build these kind of detectors so far deep underground is because they're really heavy. This is twice as heavy as the Eiffel Tower, and the soil in this area is very soft. So this, where we are now, 100 meters underground, is where the bedrock is. So uh, this is where we have to build this really, really heavy detector. And uh, it's an it's incredible challenge. Uh, so when the site was being excavated, they discovered that there was running water. And in the end, they had to freeze the running water using liquid nitrogen in order to be able to excavate. In the process, they also discovered uh, remains of a Roman villa. They found some coins and so on. So that, that also delayed the construction a little bit. So a lot of challenges. So we are all the way down to the ground floor. You see that it took a while. It's a couple of floors. <laughs> and here I can really show you in detail those orange feet that I was talking about earlier. You see them here very clearly. And these, as I said, we can pump compressed air through them just to give us a, a lower the friction enough to move these really, really heavy slices, as we call them, through the detector floor. So now you see the detector from yet another view. This is from directly below them. And, oh, wow. OK, this is cool. I believe this is a gem, a gem chamber. Noemi, this is gems? Yep. 
Yes, it I looks like yeah, one exactly. Yeah, this is great. I've never seen one up close, so now I get this opportunity myself. This is a so-called so super is... chamber because you might yes, see I that there are them. two chambers stacked on the top of each other. You probably see uh, these are very thin chambers. Yeah, and in the GE one one, we decided to have two on the top of each other to be able to create a so-called tracklet or uh, a track of the muons. Yeah, so, so, so this is a new part of the muon system which is being installed. So additional parts of muon detectors that will help us to better record these, these muons and, and in turn have an a better way to analyze the the collisions from the LHC. So these chambers, so the history of these chambers, uh, we have data, we have measuring chambers, these are the CSCs, but we, we need to, to tell the CSCs that we do need your data. This is the trigger that you already talked about. And these chambers together with the, the RPC, the gems are pretty fast chambers, so they can very quickly tell that, oops, I had a muon passing through me. So uh, the, the, the CSCs can be, can be uh, read out. Uh, in the past, so we, we installed lots of RPC chambers in, in many places, more than 400 are installed in the, the muon system, but very close to the beam pipe, we couldn't put them because they just simply cannot stand that particle density that passes through them. Uh, but today, the technology advanced so much that we can install the gems there. Yeah. So now we have a detector type that can that can cope with the uh, the, the the particle density. So they so, are very uh, close to the beam pipe. Yep. Go ahead. So I uh, I would like to sort of draw your attention to Noemi. She's going to do a magic trick now. So here we have <laughs> regular paper clips. No tricks. These are just regular paper clips. They're uh, yeah, just the kind you buy at the store. And then we hang. We have a hunk of metal here. But look at that. <laughs> what is that about? What is wow. going on? So now from a magic trick, it becomes a challenge. How many can Noemi stack? Oh, look at that. Oh, no. OK, but well, you can see. All right, can, can anybody <laughs> guess just what's going on? So this, this is really just iron. The, the, it's not a magnet. So the reason it does this is because this is what we call a residual magnetic field. So this has been exposed to such a large magnetic field for so long that it's sort of, especially these edges here, retain a residual or sort of leftover magnetic field. And it's enough to do cool tricks with your paper clips. So this is the fun part of this. But if you look at this plateau over that, this plateau is, is extremely good to put my laptop on if, if I have to, to deal with the hardware there. However, this remnant field turns off my, uh, the screen of my computer. So what is good on one hand it's might not always be problematic so on the other. Yeah. <laughs> so there's there are a lot of really tiny details. Everywhere, everywhere you look, for example, you might find uh, modules that have been produced by, these are custom made, especially the, the firmware or the software that they run might be made at somewhere like UCLA and they just stamp their name on it. And you can see a lot of these guys here. Uh, I know the ones from, uh, there's a lot with the Go Gators uh, sticker on them. <laughs> so yeah, and so on. I mean, not just US institutions, but a lot of institutions around the world. So we're, we're gonna keep walking around. Uh, again, Luis, if there's something in particular you'd like to see, let us know. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, th so there is a few things that I wanted to say. Um, based on a question in the Q&A as well. Um, so the question is essentially, what experiments are being conducted with the CMS detector? And I think this is a really important question. And, and maybe to stay, take a step back, um, the CMS experiment operates a little differently from what you might think of other large experiments. 
it is not the case that we say, for example, on Monday, we are going to do this experiment. And then on Tuesday, some other group of physicists are going to test out something else. Instead, the way it works is that the LHC, when we are, when it's in operation, when there are protons in the accelerator, we're basically just trying to collide as many protons as possible for as long as possible and collect as large amounts of data as possible. Then based on that data that we collect, we can do a range of different physics studies. And those different physics studies are designed to target different the different questions, different experiments. Um, but so in a sense, the CMS detector is the single only experiment, but we really do a lot of different physics studies using that experiment. Um, but, um, and, 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 and just to say, so, so some examples might be that um, we want to study um, the um, the so-called Higgs boson. So the Higgs boson is a fundamental particle um, associated with how different particles get their mass. Um, on the other hand, someone else might be interested in studying in detail the properties of a top quark, which is another type of elementary particle. It's the heaviest of all known elementary particles. And even though these are two potentially very different um, studies that, that physicists want to do, we all kind of start from the same data, um, these massive data sets that depending on what we want to study, we filter out in different ways um, to answer different questions. Um, and in terms of the, the data that, that, that gets collected, because the second question here on that topic, um, it gets read out and then it is uh, stored and sent to different computer clusters around the world. Um, so there is a very large um, data uh, storage center at CERN, at the main CERN site, but we also store data um, at computing clusters um, really around the world, in the US, different places in, in Europe, Asia, etc. Um, and these are all interconnected using what we call the, a grid uh, computing system such that you can access this data um, regardless of if you happen to be at that physical location or not. So Luis, if I may say a, a quick word just to add to what you're saying. Uh, the, as you said, there's a lot of these data sets. I think that's the, and um, oh, sorry, I need to fix the camera, but uh, there's a lot of these data sets, and when we're working with them, it's what we're doing a lot of the time is we're trying to filter on what we would, let's say, consider interesting events, right? So Luis said somebody might be interested in the Higgs, but in, in let's say, a specific way in, in which the Higgs decays, um, but also uh, somebody might study the top part. So they're, they're sort of filtering events that are, we call them candidate events. Uh, but we don't really know actually what is what happened in that collision. We just have the data, and we we might say it looks like a Higgs, but we don't know really. So what we have to do is we have to compare it to simulated data. We have to simulate the collisions, uh, and we do that uh, just with a lot of computing. We have uh, a lot of software-intensive uh, code that is recreating the collisions. And that's what we compare it to. So the, the programs the, that are calculating away and simulating the collisions are based on our best understanding, I, our best idea of what these, what's going on, what kind of particles there are and how they interact. And- That's, that's where the physics we, comes in. Exactly. Sorry. So if, if, if we see that the data does not look or, or, or disagrees with the prediction, then that means that well, maybe our simulation, our understanding is not quite correct. And that's how we learn. Uh, on the other hand, it might mean that there's something else that's new that we didn't anticipate that's, uh, that's actually brand new and it's an undiscovered particle. So this is really how the, the nature of our work, as I would put it. 
Back to you. I just would like to underline, you mentioned the, the word simulation. So we simulate how a particle that flies off from the, the collision point, how it interacts with the detector and we can simulate the detector signal. So this is really a big work. We have 120 million data channels in the detector and we are able to do this kind of simulation, how the, this particle interacts with the, the material of the, the detector and how it creates the electronic signals. This is inevitable if we want to understand how the physics hypothesis would look like in the detector. This is much more data than the, than the data taken by the detector. And this is, this is really a, a huge effort, but this is absolutely necessary to understand what we measure. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And actually, on the other hand, I just, just wanted to use this phrase. Uh, this is something like uh, poking in the garbage can. <laughs> so we collect all the data, all the collision data that are interesting. You just answer the question on the interesting event. Um, what, what we call deeply inelastic, just, just in a physics way. Uh, we, we try to report all these events. And among these events, the analysis people uh, look for those ones that are uh, that are concerned by the the analysis and the physics hypothesis. Uh, this is a little bit different from that of a normal lab work. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And and um, again, building on that, like the this comes back to what I said in the beginning in terms of the the fundamental questions that motivate this this work, and that is the the various basic physics questions that we're trying to answer through these experiments. Searching for um, new particles or new forces, interactions that can explain um, the unknown or help answer the unknown questions that we have about how our universe works. And one of those examples is, as I mentioned, what is dark matter? This um, additional uh, matter that we know is out there in the universe, but we don't know what it is made of. There are other questions as well, like um, there is nothing really fundamental. So there is different particles, there are different families of particles. Why are there these different families? Why do they have the different masses that they have? We know how they get their mass, that's the Higgs boson, but there's still a lot that we don't understand around the, um, the physics around, uh, around this. And in general, we're, we're trying to also not only be, um, be driven by a particular hypothesis for something, but also see more generally that we have this um, fantastic enormous facility to probe um, physics phenomena. And, and we try to also have an open mind in terms of um, searching for any deviations with respect to what we expect. Um, because anything that, that shows up that is not what we expect is by definition super interesting. Um, and it might point to something that is sort of cracking in, in the understanding of, um, in, in our model, in our understanding of how uh, the world works at these very, very small scales. We got a question concerning the data availability for people. How can it be accessed? So, the data that we create is primarily accessible for the, the institutes or, or people from those institutes who collaborate in the experiment. But after a while, I think it's two years uh, today, we open this data up for the grand public uh, through the, I think it's a CERN open data uh, uh, project and people from everywhere can access the data and can, and can watch it. Yes, the accelerator has been used to try to search for dark matter. This is one of the, the main search uh, path of, of, of all the experiments, not just the CMS. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think we may have lost our 
No, no. On the way up, we don't lose them. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> that's, that's the peculiarity of the, the 4G. But <laughs> of course, the, the data transmission slowed down very it's, much. It's not great. <laughs> yeah, so our mobile guides are now in the elevator on the way back up to surface. Um, they're showing here um, this basically, as we mentioned, we are in a so-called shutdown period. It's called long shutdown two, um, where there are various upgrades and maintenance going on. Um, and during this period, there's really a very tight schedule of um, the work that is ongoing, that, that the work that is going on. Um, and so what you could see in the detector is a very detailed map of the different parts of the detectors and different work that is ongoing in different um, in different areas, different aspects um, for that particular day. It's really on a per day schedule. Um, yeah, so th there's another question about the dark matter. So with dark matter, we think that it is likely some new type of particle. And so um, that's me. <laughs> we have a wall here of um, a CMS wall with pictures of different collaborators on the CMS experiment. Um, so yeah, and, and I'll come back to the dark matter. I just wanted to say also that- This was just a very nice- uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, but one of the things that is so unique at, at CERN and with at the CMS experiment, but also at CERN more generally. It's not unique just to CMS, it applies for the other experiments as well. And that is this very, very international collaboration, this international environment that we have here. Um, CERN and the research here at CERN is really bringing together um, engineers, technicians, um, physicists from all around the world. Um, and that is really critical. It's that these projects are so large that they cannot really feasibly done, be done by just um, uh, a single country or a single university. And um, it's a pretty unique place to, to work and, and be because um, you have people from, as I said, all around the world that are coming here driven by the same um, basic goal in terms of trying to understand the universe and, and nature better. Um, so I don't know how if we need to finish up or if I can have another minute. Amanda? We don't oh, hear you. You're muted, Amanda. Like I haven't been doing this for the last year. Um, <laughs> we have about, we have until like, actually 10 before the students get the break from the program if we have some more questions otherwise okay well then i will at least answer the question that i had started answering um so the, the question is what are you looking for when doing experiments to research dark matter and um this applies either to doing an experiment to research dark matter but it can also be um more general in terms of how the experiments are being done. And so in general, what we do is that we start from some hypothesis of what we expect to see in the detector. Um, and then we test that uh, hypothesis. Um, and so when it comes to dark matter, we think there, there are certain things that we know about dark matter. We know that it's not a particle that is electrically charged, for example. We also know that it interacts extremely weakly. Um, it interacts almost not at all with anything. Um, and so if dark matter is some new type of particle, the way that we would see it in our CMS detector is basically as a missing particle. So we can look at balances, energy balances in the detector, and we can indirectly deduce that, oh, here they must have a particle um, that travels through the detector. And, um, and, and, and that is, for example, for dark matter, that there, there are other more details in terms of how, how this gets done. Um, but I think that's, um, yeah, just a little bit more about how, how, how that is done. And it's, it's again using, as we were saying but earlier, again, these very large yeah. so what simulations. We have, exactly. Yeah. So what we have to say, oh, sorry. Well, very, very quickly, because <laughs> like you mentioned energy balances, and it might 
sounds like it's very complicated and it can, it can be, but you can also just think about the fact that we have particles traveling basically the speed of light in this one direction. So before the collision, there is essentially no uh, energy, that there's no energy in the transverse plane. So after the collision, the total energy in the transverse plane should be zero. And if you look at the mass of collisions that comes out and you count the energy, the transverse energy of those particles, transverse meaning just going, you know, <laughs> perpendicular to the direction of the particles, then you can sum that amount of energy. And if there's some missing and it points somewhere, you, you can indirectly tell that there's a missing particle. So if I may have a remark on this, so uh, the one, con one thing, one confession is that uh, uh, we talk about uh, Higgs's, W's, Z's, dark matter, whatever. But what we have to, to, to tell that we cannot see these particles directly. What we see is that decay particles. And uh, this links to the transverse energy as well. So if the, the particle collision is nothing like uh, but uh, 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 elastic collision, like the pool game, then you wouldn't expect energy in the transverse plane. The transfer in in order to get energy in the transverse plane is it requires some inter intermediate state like the Higgs or the Ws or Zs or whatever. So uh, from the flying out particles, you can reconstruct what happened in the middle. Actually, with the use of the physics hypothesis and the the, the, the Monte Carlos, the, the simulations, and uh, and this would this would point to the to the dark matter as well, because the dark matter would anyway have something that you could see from the dark matter decay. You would have an ordinary matter flowing uh, uh, flying out as well as the dark matter. The ordinary matter you can detect, the dark matter would be the missing. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's, that's a really, really good point. I think we hadn't mentioned that before, so thank you, Sultan, for bringing that up. <laughs> Sorry. No, but because in, in, indeed that um, the particles that we can detect, that we directly detect, are electrons, or photons, muons, and we also have so-called hadrons, charged or neutral hadrons, like um, maybe you've not heard about these, but they're so-called pions and kaons. And, but the point is that there's only so many particles that are actually what, what shows up that we detect in the detector. And so when we talk about detecting a Higgs boson, as Sultan was saying, we don't actually have a Higgs boson that we that hit part of the detector and then we then record as a Higgs boson. But really, most of these particles, like the Higgs boson, for example, is extremely short lived. So it decays essentially instantaneously as it is created. And we record the products of what it decays into. And we can then work backward to understand what happened in the collision. And, and that type of um, understanding what happened in the collision based on what we record um, is also what Anders mentioned that we don't do this on a absolute event or collision by collision basis, because we can never say with 100% certainty that this, the way this collision looks, it was 100% sure a Higgs boson. What we can say is that if we study a large number of these collisions, we can start to make out that, well, okay, we see this happening in a large fraction of collisions and we can deduce by statistical methods that, okay, with some degree of certainty, um, we have seen Higgs bosons decaying in our detector. So even things like, how many Higgs bosons do we expect? How often do we expect them to appear? That is That also sort of plays into what we understand or do not understand, so why our expectation. So if we get more Higgs bosons than we expected, we're like, hmm. <laughs> if we get too few, we're like, 
hmm. exactly. It's exactly. it's all very interesting. And when you talked about the lifetime, the Higgs, uh, it 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 decays immediately, like ten to the minus twenty something. But you have other particles where it gets really really interesting. You have B quarks, and these are hadrons, mm -hmm. like the ones you you uh, talked about. But they live long enough that they can travel a detectable distance. We can using our detector. Uh, we can use this fact to identify this kind of particle. So I, I don't want to elaborate too much. I, the, there's a lot of really interesting stuff. I mean, this is just kind of like yeah. a few hints. Yeah, here, yeah. You know? and, and maybe there's one last thing on that general topic that this lack of um, absoluteness in a sense is connected to, maybe you guys have at some point heard about quantum mechanics. Um, so taking a step further we, we talk about quantum field theory but, but really it's it's kind of a property of the physics that we have to use to describe these very very small subatomic scales um that is driving yeah this so on. it's not just that we're not doing the the best job at exactly identifying. it's just a really it's fundamentally it's a fundamental part unable of it. to distinguish them yeah. yeah maybe we don't have to go into any more of that but just <laughs> just to sort of I just um, wanted to show you. a picture. Yeah, yeah, this is really nice. This is a <laughs> this is a picture of what a collision can look like in the detector. And we have um, the blue line, for example, it's a, a trace of a muon, I believe. Sorry, the red line, the red line. And uh, we have the green, corresponds to energy that was recorded in the calorimeters and the yellow is different traces of electrically charged particles and you can see there's quite a lot happening at the same time mm -hmm. here that one has to actually this shifter. is an x candidate as far as i know yeah so that yeah, so decays into two muons and two yeah. photons but this is what we see in the end is just energy deposits in our detector let's say or tracks in our detector but it's it's very uh, suggestive. Oh, this could be a Higgs, but we don't actually know. This could be a, a C event. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I think maybe Amanda wanted to say something. Oh, I, I just was going to say I didn't see any more um, questions coming in, um, but thank you all so much. Uh, thanks. You uh, you know, over at CMS, you're always so accommodating for Fermilab and our students um, to do these virtual visits. And I was super excited that the detector is still open for them to see that. So um, I just wanted, they have about nine minutes. Um, so uh, target students, um, I didn't hear back from Jomar. So I'm going to make the executive decision that you get a little bit longer break today. Um, so make sure um, you sign back on to the uh, Zoom with him at 1030. And um, if you have any questions, um, every, I think everyone has my email, send it to me or to Jomar and I can send that on to uh, the group over at CMS in case, in case if, you, if you're like me and you think of something later, <laughs> that happens all the time. So uh, um, I don't know if there's anything else you wanna say. anything from us at this moment i don't have anything the 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 only re remark i would like to make on the detector that we are in the end game of the so-called long shutdown too we are i think once you finish with the brill uh, <laughs> <laughs> there will be no more uh, tasks to be done before we close the detector yes. so i think in a couple of weeks maximum a month we are going to close it and this is going to be kept closed until LS3, which is uh, three, four years ahead. Yeah, I gotta get on the phone to give a green light so that things can get closed. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you so much again. This was, this was awesome. And students, thanks for your great questions. They were really good too. So um, yeah. we'll see you back at 1030 and um, enjoy your afternoon over at CMS. So thank you. Thanks Bye. For Thanks for following. Follow with it. <laughs> <laughs>